Welcome to the Financial Times. I'm Claire Barrett and we will be with you for the next hour live from the FT studio celebrating International Women's Day. And I want to put the emphasis on celebrate and just because there's so much negativity around about women and finances. There's lots of really worrying numbers about the small amount of retirement savings that women have to men, the gender pay gap, the gender pensions gap. People are now calling it the gender finance gap. But we want to come together today to give women watching and their partners hope that there can be an alternative and that there is a positive message um, for us to spread when it comes to women managing their finances. And I'm joined by three wonderful experts um, in the FT studio today who are going to help us do that in just a minute, because this is a free event, but we can't get you here um, without getting you to do a little bit of work um, for us. This will help flick the financial literacy and inclusion campaign um, for which the FT is putting on um, this event with. We want to ask you a question before we get going. So get your phones out. You're probably on them already. And little, have a little photo of the QR code, please, on the screen. And it will come up with a poll. We want to know how financially confident your feeling. Um, there's a little multiple choice there, a range of options going from very confident, could be more confident, not at all confident. So please do join in the poll and vote. We're going to ask you again um, how you feel about this in, in an hour after you've listened um, to our experts. So please vote away. Um, the other thing that you can do, because this is an interactive session, um, is that while we are um, talking, you can submit your own questions to the panel. I've already got a list um, of some really good ones that people sent in when they registered, and we'll get through as many of those as possible. But don't wait until the end if you've got a question. There's a little box somewhere on your screen. Depends on what platform you're watching us on. It should be fairly obvious. If you're watching us on Catch Up, then sorry, uh, you'll have to send me an email instead, money at ft.com. Um, but do put your questions in and we'll get through as many as we can um, in the last third of our hour together. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about four things that me and the panel think that women really need to know about money and relationships. Now, I can just about see um, on the screen to the right of me that we have a lot of people who are perhaps not feeling the most confident with their finances watching our webinar. Well, that's great because you're in the right place. We're hopefully going to give you um, some really good tips and pointers um, in the hour to come that you can put to work and we'll come back and ask you again at the end of the session what you feel. Now, I'm going to start by introducing Davinia Tomlinson. Davinia, welcome to the FT. It's wonderful to have you here. Now, the reason that I particularly wanted to have you on this panel is because not only um, do you run your own business, which you set up yourself, uh, which helps lots and lots of women um, get to grips with their finances, your personal story is also really interesting because you had a big job in the city that you quit to follow your passion projects. <laughs> yes, so thank you, Claire. It's a great introduction. Um, so yes, my background was in investment management, so I spent the best part of two decades working in the industry and loved it. Um, but what I recognised is that as you've correctly outlined in the, the introduction, there was, is this widening chasm between men and women when it comes to our propensity to manage our, our money, invest our money for the long term. And I couldn't understand why. And I think coming from such a matriarchal background as I do, mm. you know, in recognising that women very much held the purse strings within my household, I wanted to see that success replicated elsewhere. And that's really where Rain Check was born. And of course, that's now extended into my book, Cash is Queen, which yeah. is all about helping the next generation of young women take control of their financial futures early as well. Now, we'll talk a little bit about Cash is Queen because it's aimed at a really interesting cohort of, of women to be, I suppose yes. I should say, 10 to 16 year olds. Absolutely. Why did you pick to do it? Why did you pick them? You know, something that you said that I really liked about the in the introduction was about putting a really positive spin on International Women's Day. We are plagued by really negative messages, some of which we'll get into over the course of this conversation. But I'm always quite pragmatic when it comes to the think the solutions around, you know, really achieving financial success. And one of the things that I recognise is that there's a lot of discourse right now. There's a lot of chat. It's very noisy, particularly on social media, in this conversation around women and money. But 
I felt that we were missing a trick in that we were waiting until people reached adulthood and we were already, you know, knee deep in the mire of financial complexity, managing our finances, navigating some of these conversations in our households before we started to try and educate women about how they could optimise their financial well-being. And so what I wanted to do in Cash is Queen was to address the next generation, really targeting young ladies on the cusp of adulthood as they're mm. going through adolescence. We've got all of these other competing pressures, puberty, periods, getting our training bras, all of these things, you know, that can stress you out as a teenage girl. But what I wanted to do was to empower them and have them feel that money was something that they could achieve mastery in long before they reached adulthood. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. We need our financial training too. Well, Davinia Tomlinson, our second guest today, if you listen to Money Clinic podcasts, then you will have already met um, Nicola Sharps, Jeff, Dr. Nicola, um, I should say. You have got a similar story to Davinia in the sense that you quit your job to start off your own enterprise. But unlike Davinia, yours is a charity, a very important charity, Surviving Economic Abuse, SEA. Tell us a little bit about how you came to be doing that. Well, thank you, Claire, for having me here today on this fantastic panel of women. I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have. But yes, my background is in the women's sector, so working in the violence against women and girls, um, domestic abuse space. And I've been fortunate throughout my career to meet a lot of victims and survivors through that work. And I think what really struck me um, as I spoke to them was the economic impact that the abuse had had on them. So that included economic control as part of the abuse that they'd experienced, but also how that led them to be in a position where they really struggled to move forward and to be independent. And I think, you know, this could happen to any one of us. And I remember seeing um, reflected back to me um, my own self and it just made me really passionate because I felt that the potential of some of the women that I had spoken to had been curtailed. Um, they weren't living the life that they should have been living. Um, and as I say, it made me really passionate to raise awareness of this particular form of abuse. Um, certainly at that time, back in 2003, there was no research about economic abuse. No one was really speaking about it. There weren't particular practice responses to it within the domestic abuse sector. So um, some years later, after gathering lots of information, going um, to Australia, going to America, seeing best practice there, I came back really wanting to ensure that victims and survivors in the UK had those same responses. So yes, that led me to make a similarly difficult decision. Um, I went part-time at work and I um, established Surviving Economic Abuse back in 2017. And um, I think the success of the charity is just a reflection of how much it's needed. Mm, it really is. I mean, some people might say um, economic abuse, others might say financial abuse, but basically boiled down, it's somebody using finance as a tool to control somebody else. That could be withholding money from it, could be taking money they earn, could be restricting access, saying they can't spend money on certain things. Do listen to the podcast that, that we made. So we even have a financial expert, uh, the wonderful Sarah Coles from Hargreaves Lansdowne, who many of you will know her name from being quoted in the FT multiple times. Um, but she was brave enough to um, come on the podcast and tell how she suffered financial abuse because it is so hidden and people don't realise how common it is. It really is common. One in six of us or one in six women will have experienced um, economic, including financial abuse um, from a current or a former partner. So when you're kind of sat around, you know, a table with your friends at a restaurant, enjoying an occasion, um, you know, there will be a number of you there who will have experienced um, financial abuse. And it's so important that we start talking about it. I'm really excited about Davinia's book because, you know, it kind of creates those tools for conversations mm -hmm. so we can start normalising uh, discussions around finances, you know, so much earlier on um you know what, what it looks like um to have a balanced um relationship um perhaps with your partner moving forward um and how that can you know impact your life and the things that you might need to think about and perhaps warning signs that you might need to look out for if someone's seeking to control you in the way that you described claire excellent well thank you for joining us today now our final guest is toby asari now toby the lovely link with you is that a year ago on international women's day we we're at an event upstairs yes, um, at the top of the FT. We're in the basement today in the FT studio. You've had a very busy year. 
you launched your blog several years ago, My Bump Pay. Yes. Tell us a little bit about how you came to do that and then the exciting project that you've got that goes live tomorrow. Brilliant. Thank you. So My Bump Pay is a platform designed to help women smash the glass ceiling with a baby on the way and beyond. And I started it having been the very first person in my organisation in that particular office location to go on maternity leave. I was incredibly ambitious and I had lots of questions about how I was going to make it work and stay on that success trajectory that I was on. Amongst having all these questions, I talked to my friends about it, different people along the journey, and I'd find that I wasn't alone. And actually, I just had a spark one day to think, what if I put all of this information that is actually already out there, but put it all in one place in a way that's really engaging, in a way that people can grapple with it, but also in a way that gives people the confidence to make the right decisions with all the information at their fingertips. So it's been an incredible journey, started off as a blog, then kind of transferred over to Instagram and is now um, in the form of a book called The Blend, which is out tomorrow. Have you got one with you? Yes, I have a copy with me, so I'll wave it in front of the camera. Okay. Um, Yeah, it's out tomorrow, but available to purchase now. Well, it's really, really good. And we're going to be talking more uh, later on about navigating maternity leave and the conversations you need to have with your partner before even trying um, for a baby. So don't forget, there is a box somewhere on your screen where you can submit questions. If you get an idea for a question, put it in. I can see them all on the iPad. I might throw a few in um, as we go along to spice things up, but we'll definitely get to as many as we can in the final third. So of our four things that we said that we think every woman should know about money, I think one of the most important ones is how you manage money with your partner. Now, this is a topic which we've already had (laughs) quite a few questions about um, from people who pre-registered, particularly when one of them earns more um, than the other, which is interesting. But Davinia, I'll start with you because you were talking about this very topic with um, our adored colleague, Isabel Berwick, who presents the Working It um, podcast for the FT um, a couple of weeks ago. Yes. I mean, Isabel was a great guest. And one of the things that she highlighted, which I think is a thing many women know, maybe subconsciously, but she talked about coming home and doing the second shift. Yeah. So imagine, you know, being in a household, you know, particularly heterosexual relationships in which both parties are going out to work irrespective of whether or not you have children, but of course, and as Toby can attest, and I'm sure she'll talk about that, um, you know, it's compounded by having children, but irrespective of whether or not you are parents, women coming home, having worked a full day at work, and then having to do a second shift of domestic labour, unpaid, in the household. And we know, you know, off the back of the pandemic, seeing the disproportionate impact of unpaid labour that women were having to shoulder responsibility for and the contribution that that had made. I think UN Women had done a brilliant study that attempted to quantify that contribution in terms of GDP worldwide. It was immense. So to consider, you know, women not being paid for that and the opportunity cost, as we've discussed, of, you know, you going home and having to do all of this additional labour. Of course, there are implications for your well-being, but of course, it also puts pressure and tension on the relationship. Um, So it really is interesting to think about the extent to which as women we are having these kinds of conversations in our relationships. Um, And one of the things, you know, prior to this, you know, webinar we talked about, you know, in our in our prep session was around not just the extent to which we we feel confident having those conversations, but actually the behaviours, the psychological consequences Mm. of what we observe in childhood, uh, what we observe in our parents' relationships and what we normalise because I think that has a much stronger bearing on what we go on to perpetuate in our relationships, uh, whether or not we acknowledge that. Mm, I can see you nodding there, Nicola. <laughs> but, it, but it is very true, isn't it? I, I mean, I grew up with a mum and dad who made all of their financial decisions together. Um, so for me, that's normal. But for a lot of um, older women in particular, having the man lead the financial decisions because he's the one who maybe earns um, the lion's share of the money, has become the more normal pattern. But then again, Toby, with you working, launching your book, um, you know, going um, all guns blazing, setting up blogs, your children are seeing you doing that and having a very, very different impression um, of, you know, this is something that that, that mummy does that they're, they're really proud of. Yeah. And it's encouraging. I have a son and I have a daughter. My daughter's incredibly fierce and very independent (laughs) at the age of three. Um, But my son is very aware that this period and this season is about me working hard for 
for various different reasons. He knows about the book. He's very impressed. He said it has a lot of words and there's no pictures. <laughs> um, so, but I really hope that I'm raising a son that understands there are different roles within a household and however, whatever blend within your household works and the conversations that you have within your household about careers and money flow two ways and isn't just necessarily one party and also household responsibilities. Um, my husband is amazing. And obviously during this very busy season, he's leaning in a little bit more so that I have the flexibility and the time and space to do all the wonderful things around this book. Mm. A couple of the questions that we're getting um, coming in, some people are questioning whether there's a difference between the way that women and men um, manage their money. Other people are saying that because of the earnings differential between them in a couple um, should people be contributing differently um, into the joint account if you have a joint account because very few people seem to have one nowadays um, I suggested on Lorraine this morning maybe it shouldn't be 50 50 particularly if it's after you've gone back to work after having children you've cut your hours down your earnings power has has been gone but how could you um, bring up this um in, in in conversation any 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 tips for people who are watching thinking yes actually i've never thought about that because <laughs> it's the lack of disposable income i think that prevents women um from investing more from from saving more that is the biggest barrier um it's not that we don't know about investing that we don't realize how important it is it's just literally having the cash mm. I think from my perspective and speaking as somebody that is divorced and so coming at the end of a relationship um, and learning some of the lessons. And it's one of the things that I'm always quite keen to share with the Rainmaker community, because I think a lack of transparency is, again, one of the things, one of the impediments to women being able to assert economic independence and empowerment and really self-advocate. And I think it has to start in your relationship if you are in a relationship and you have a partner, it has to feel like a partnership. And so any attempt to conceal what's happening, particularly around finances, but of course it extends into lots of other things, and I'm sure Nicola can talk extensively yeah, about some of those next. triggers. Mm. Um, but the reason I highlight divorce is because I think it's one of the things that comes up quite frequently with the Rainmaker community, so my client base at Raincheck, as one of the you know one of the milestones that a woman might a woman might go through at which suddenly you're forced to confront your finances in a way that you perhaps hadn't had to previously mm. and so i think it's really important that you start your relationship on the basis of full transparency and that might look like saying right you know i think we should have a money date um it doesn't have to be in the household but try you know trying to sexy it up a bit and, and not make it such a you know <laughs> like perfunctory that. thing yeah. yeah you know do it outside the household if you think that it potentially might get contentious try to unpick some of the reasons why and again that might come back to as you described what you observed in your household claire might be different from what your husband observed so just trying to you know start from a position of empathy and compassion you're in love with one another so that's a good place to begin but I think just taking the time to recognise that having that openness is ultimately what will mean everybody gets to benefit. So nobody should feel that they are disadvantaged mm. by those conversations. Well, I couldn't agree more. We definitely need to make time to talk about money. We make appointments for everything else, mm. the hairdresser, <laughs> the beauty um, treatment. So, you know, why not? Why not money? And I think it does reduce the, the, the tension mm. um, and arguments that can result if you try and start a conversation about how much one or the other of you spends while you're trying to go to sleep. <laughs> but, but, I mean, Nicola, obviously there is a dark side to, to this. Now, some, um, you know, financial concealment, you could call it, or one person being more of the master of money in relationship than the other. I mean, I am that person um, in my relationship. It can often come from a place of, of love. Um, it can often come from a place of the other person, whether male or female, not really wanting to be that involved. Because, I mean, if I was paid by the hour for all of the financial admin I did for my family, <laughs> I wouldn't need to work for the FT. <laughs> but obviously, the darker side is that it can be used um, for negative reasons. Absolutely. So I think this point about being secretive about finances might be a warning sign, mm -hmm. um, a partner w not wanting to have that discussion, finding excuses not to have it. Um, always amazed by the number of victims and survivors I speak to who didn't know how much their partner earned, for example. They didn't mm -hmm. know whether their name was on the mortgage for the house. Um, so really important to be having those conversations really early on. And I guess um, what I would say around you know we all have arguments of course we don't we don't always agree but the the kind of the line for me in terms of what's an argument and what becomes abusive and a form of control is whether or not um, you know you're 
confident and you feel safe to have those conversations so mm. are you in a relationship where you can speak about these issues um where you're not concerned that by raising them um there might be some kind of punishment or retribution for example for doing so uh, i was really struck actually by the um column that you wrote after our podcast a few weeks ago claire where you talked about um like a spreadsheet um, with one of your friends. Um, mm. And it goes back to that point about whether you put 50-50 into a joint account, for example, or you you split bills if you're on different um, um, earnings, uh, levels yeah. of earnings, you know, whereby I think you talked about an example where perhaps um, the couple went to an expensive restaurant, um, you know, and there was a, a comment a disagreement. about a disagreement yeah. happened. And then it would be like, oh, well, make sure you put your 50% yeah. on the spreadsheet. And that meant because that person was earning less money, it meant they had less disposable mm. income. And it meant they weren't going to be able to socialise, you know, for the rest of the month because of the budget. I mean, it's so powerful because, you know, that tactic, you know, which is absolutely financial control, really then starts playing to other forms of coercive and controlling behaviour that we see. So, you know, isolation, um, not being able to go out and see friends and family, socialise with them. Um, these people who could potentially ask questions which could make you think actually this isn't right what's happening so a real um deliberate isolation you know not being able to um put more credit on your phone or being worried about you know making too many calls if you're on a contract because you might not be able to pay the bill um you know we really see financial abuse threading through all these different forms of coercive and controlling behavior mm. well that's where we made it the the second thing that we want women to know on this webinar how to spot the signs now the article that that you referred to um, I quoted some information from Your Juno, which is an app that's aimed at Gen Z women. If you don't know what Gen Z is, it basically means under the age of, of 25, I think. But nevertheless, when I met the founders of Your Juno, I just asked an off the cuff question saying, what kind of financial content on your educational app um, did you sort of not recognise that there would be a need for? And I was really shocked when they said, um, recognising the signs of financial abuse was something that younger women especially wanted to know about. So my um, big kind of call to action um, today and in that column was that we need to start speaking about money in relationships earlier on, because that was something that they picked up as being key. I mean, it's partly because we're British, Nicola, isn't it? We feel a bit awkward about discussing money. At what point when you're dating do you sort of have the big sort of reveal about, you know, well, I, I earn this much money or I own my own, own house or, you know, some other kind of marker of your, of, of, of your status. But there are ways that you can early on, and I'll bring you on this too, Davinia, with your book, there are ways that you can talk about money very, very early in a relationship to sort of make it a bit more normal and also test the waters. Uh, absolutely. There's so many different ways in which you can introduce that conversation. Um, again, I think in your article, you spoke about, you know, perhaps doing a quiz together and, you know, kind of in having a discussion about the questions. You know, I think it was if you uh, if I spent £100 on something and didn't tell you, you know, how would you react to that kind of thing? Um, you know, I think, you know, to your point that as a society, we definitely don't talk about finances. We also don't talk about abuse. So I kind of see it as a double taboo. So with financial abuse, we're kind of bringing together two things that we just don't talk about as a society. So really important, you know, and I would say, you know, from sort of early on, I speak to victims and survivors who say, actually, looking back, there were some real signs. Um, mm. You know, I was always picking up, you know, the bill for um, when we went out for dinner in a restaurant or, um, you know, actually the, at the beginning, it looked like really caring um, behavior. So, you know, you're so busy. You know, I get to the point about, you know, the second shift, you know, you're so busy. Why don't I take care of the finances so that you have time to spend with the children? Or again, you know, you don't need to go back to work. Um, you know, you can spend time with the children. You don't have to worry about that. I earn enough for the both of us. And what we learn um, through speaking to victims and survivors is that, you know, just little by little, and they don't really notice it necessarily, but they suddenly realise that they're losing that independence. Um, you know, a really similar thing around joint bank accounts, which actually is a, a bit of a telltale sign, again, in relation to domestic abuse, is the partner insisting on setting up a joint bank account, saying, you know, if you really cared about me in this relationship, if you were in a partner, a, a partnership with me, you wouldn't need your own bank account. You know, so this importance of, you know, kind of hanging on to your um, financial independence so that if you do kind of, you know, get to the point where you're sort of blind on the joint finances, again, to your point about disposable income, you know, just having that £100 available. Um, we know that women who don't have access to £100 at short notice are three and a half times more likely to experience abuse mm. because the perpetrator recognises that they've got no way out. Gosh, that's a really, really damning statistic. 
Toby, Davinia, do you want to come in on this yeah. topic? Toby, I think you've written about this actually in your book. Well, I think money in general is really important to talk about. And we talk about talking about money and how we actually don't talk about money. And there's lots of studies that show that if women don't talk about money, therefore they're less confident in negotiating for money and salaries. And that's lots of stuff that we cover in the book. And it's really important at every stage of your career, not just as you enter into parenthood. But there's a study that shows that if women don't do that over their lifetime, they could lose between 1 million and 1.5 million pounds left on the table over their lifetime. So these conversations about money, your book, your work that you do and the work and your book and Claire, also your book are vitally important to make sure that we have the skills the confidence and we feel comfortable talking about money at all stages of life so we don't lose lose that huge amount of money and um, to be left on the table so let me being an fc journalist <laughs> let me interrogate that one million pound figure slightly so this is things like not asking for a pay rise and you don't get that money not moving jobs maybe because you work part-time that's something that i see again and again with my own friends i go part-time and I find it harder to job hop mm. and it's the job hop yeah. that increases the earnings power more significantly than kind of natural um, promotion within the same organization what what else not being able to afford to pay into the pension missing the yes match. that's a huge one I think that's mm. where that you probably see the largest chasm is if you are taking maybe a particular type of employment because you maybe are forced to maybe because of childcare or because of the way that your um, life is just set up then therefore you're contributing less into your pension pot especially if you're not claiming child benefit and therefore you're kind of missing out on those those credits to make sure that you've got enough yeah um so there are various different ways that we could miss out but i also just think just negotiating Mm. in Mm. general just having the confidence and the willingness to ask oh okay is that it? Or, but why? Or doing your research around a particular sphere, so be it a, a career, and making sure that you know that you're being paid your market rate and your market value. Um, and I also think maternity leave or coming back into work is a really interesting and important inflection point. If you are on a career trajectory, if you are on the trajectory for a promotion, don't think, oh, I have to be so grateful to come back to my work. I'm just going to sit here and not get back on that tr- promotion track that I was on absolutely go for it make sure that you are included in any kind of salary um reviews if you are on maternity leave those are all points at which we should be talking about money that sometimes as women we shy away from Mm. use your contact days wisely now (laughs) i'm going to throw to a question here just because nicola we've had a question from somebody watching it's slightly upsetting to to read it um she says my husband has asked for every single savings account login that I have, the login name and the password. But I don't know about any of his investments. My question is, is this financial abuse? Well, based on what you just said, it certainly doesn't sound like a healthy balance within a relationship. It certainly doesn't sound like a balance, does it, if that's not reciprocated um, in terms of the behaviour. And one of the things we see around that kind of blindness that can happen um, is the login details, um, you know, could be taken and in this instance changed. So she then can't get back into her own Mm. savings accounts, which would be really worrying. So um, I think, you know, in this situation, um, it could be a sign of abuse. um, And I would in this situation perhaps suggest that she speak to her bank um, Mm. about this. who you know can perhaps support her and, and find a way um, of managing this situation alongside um, a support line or service. Um, certainly if you go onto the Surviving Economic Abuse website um, there'll be some information there um, about how she could find out more but I'm um, really really upsetting to hear but fantastic to have this space where that can be shared and, and, and this listener can have a think about about what they might do but yeah I would absolutely um, you know suggest that she takes some some advice and, and get some support around this um, yeah. perhaps well, talk to friends and family and bring them in a little bit yes definitely talk to friends and family and thank you for putting it out there and being brave mm-hmm. to, to ask the question there's Absolutely. lots of other really good questions that are coming in keep them coming uh, we'll, we will get through as many as as we can i promise i'm going to move on to our next topic now um which is um <laughs> about how how you can deal with the single tax. Now, when I first said I wanted to make this one of the four topics that that we talked about, a couple of people said, well, what is the single tax? And I have to say, as somebody who was single um, for most of her 20s, I'm married now, just about, hanging on (laughs) by my fingernails. um, It's just so much harder to do anything financially if there's one of you. 
quantitative easing, the soaring um, house prices that we've seen over the last 15 years since I managed to buy um, a flat as a single person, uh, you know, I'd struggle to buy the same flat now, um, even on a on a higher wage if I was completely on my own. And this is something that does have a bearing um, on our romantic relationships. I mean, Davinia, I don't know how you tackled this in, in, in Cash as Queen, but one thing that worries me is that people couple up and move in together sooner than perhaps the relationship is, is ready for, for kind of economic reasons. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the conversations we were having earlier was about, you know, cultural differences where this is concerned and perhaps feeling, particularly in societies in which there is a much greater uh, gap in terms of, you know, wealth distribution um, and where women are almost at the mercy of, you know, higher earning men um, and finding themselves forced to stay in relationships which are probably well past their sell-by dates, perhaps, you know, just because you've grown apart or even worse, you know, if you are in a situation where there is evidence of economic or other types of abuse. Um, and so, of course, you know, as you, you correctly have outlined where Cashy's Queen is concerned, from my perspective, it was really important to start to socialise some of these ideas with a younger audience sooner so that they recognise the importance of asserting their own financial independ independence, what that means and why, you know, and we, we, we talk about um, romantic relationships, obviously in a very light way. This is, you know, the, the demographic is 11 to 16 year olds. So we're not talking about it at great length, but it really is important that the young women that are reading that book recognise the importance of who they have around them. Mm. We talk about money tribe, for example, which is a really important message. And, you know, when you think about your tribe, it's about much more than just your finances, but who are your friends, who are in, who's in your circle, who are the people you can ask advice of? Um, you know, there's lots of evidence of, you know, young women getting advice, getting information, and I guess young people from social media, you know, mm. this TikTok craze, and we see the insidious effects and the consequences of that, whether people are getting financial advice from social media, whether they're getting romantic advice from social media. And so it's important that there is a really sound and solid resource through which they're able to say, right, these are some best practice principles. Um, and being an exemplar or an opinion leader in your group of friends and saying, right, these are some of the things that I think are important for me and how that plays out into your romantic relationships. You don't feel forced into a situation or forced to stay in a situation mm. that no longer serves you. I think that's really powerful for that group. Mm. And Nicola, certainly I mean, a lot of the work that your charity is doing is helping women to leave um, abusive relationships. But when they become a single parent or a single person that's a really vulnerable time for them financially and otherwise yeah it really is i was really struck um, by what davinia was saying just then because we know um through um the work of women's aid that the number of victims and survivors trapped in relationships right now relationships right now is is huge you know scaringly so um you know it's the number one reason why a lot of victims and survivors don't leave an abuser um it's the one reason why they return as well so it's really important that we're supporting around economic well-being at this time and certainly through one of our frontline partners, Money Advice Plus, um, one of the kind of really powerful tools that we would have around encouraging a victim survivor to leave, giving them the confidence to do so, was to be able to work out a budget and say, actually, you, you know, you can survive alone, you know, despite what your partner has told you, that you're hopeless with money, that you'll never be able to survive on your own. Actually, you can do this. And what we're finding, um, again, is almost... Um, you know, two thirds have a negative budget now um, or less than £100 disposable income. So, you know, that decision to leave is getting harder and harder. Um, and then, as you correctly say, the context in rebuilding your life as a single um, person or parent is getting harder and harder. And again, the idea of doing that um, is so scary that sometimes, you know, staying with an abuser and at least kind of knowing where you are and perhaps having a roof over your head um you know becomes a trade-off which it just absolutely shouldn't be so we need to be doing more to support victims and survivors um leaving abusers absolutely um because again you know you would say well if you if you left um that partner you would be safe um but you know you might move in with someone a new partner sooner than you want to because you're struggling financially you might have to borrow from a doorstep lender who then asks you for sex because you can't make your payment and, you know, you continue to perhaps have the same dangers, but also new dangers, mm. um, which again are linked, you know, um, to issues around violence against women and girls. So, you know, that point about financial economic independence is so important. Mm. Mm. Well, Toby, I'll bring you into this because, of course, being a single parent mm. adds an extra dimension um, yeah. to, to the single tax, doesn't yeah, it? It absolutely does, especially if you have small children who are of the age where they're 
potentially could be going to nursery versus going to school that cost can be it's astronomical as it is mm. for individuals that are in a relationship but let alone being somebody who's not in a relationship or happens to be a single parent and to those people out there I would say it's finding your tribe and finding your village and if you're very fortunate to have parents and grandparents nearby lean on them if you can as much as possible but also friends can help people at the school gates you know build community where you are as much as you possibly can Um, but also maybe even speak to your employer and see what they what they offer they may offer some contribution towards childcare, whether it's some kind of salary sacrifice scheme Um, and if they don't (laughs) try and have a conversation about about that because that will enable you to have more focus on your work and kind of lead into your career so hopefully that might help you in the long run in terms of your earnings trajectory to try and help hopefully offset the challenges of being a single parent. Okay well if you've got more questions for us about the single tax um, do put them in I I can see some really good ones coming in on the iPad so we're going to cover our fourth and final area now before we move on um, to to viewers questions which is the money things that you need to know and have talked about to your partner before you even think about trying for a baby. (laughs) Toby do you want to kick us off on this one? (laughs) Lots. And we talk about them in the in the book. But I think that I think the two critical things before you think about starting a family are um, understanding what your career journeys might look like. And that's for you as an individual and that's for the other partner and really having a really honest and frank discussion about what are the some of the things that you want to achieve. Now, this book is saying that you can absolutely achieve those things along the way whilst growing your family, but you do have to be incredibly strategic. So having that conversation, being really open about how do we want to potentially do this theoretically? How do we want to navigate childcare? So that's one thing as an example. And then the second thing I would say, I say a lot, I preach about it a lot, but have a look at your maternity and paternity policy Mm. or parental leave policy. It is an absolute must. Do not get a nasty surprise as to some kind of eligibility criteria um, that can often affect how much you're paid for. Or on the other hand, you could get a wonderful surprise that you find out that your partner might be eligible, for example, for six months paid leave Um, and it's really really interesting what you'll find nowadays I work for an organization where they have just removed eligibility criteria in terms of length of um, employment for any paid leave great which is fantastic Mm -hmm. so that's why I really encourage people to both parties in the relationship to have a look at Mm -hmm. their policies and to see what they're eligible for before they start into the wonderful baby making stage <laughs> well um, I, I say, I say <laughs> <laughs> you, won't, <laughs> you won't talk so much about, about that you don't need any of our advice so you know carry on carry on them as you as you were with, with that bit. but well, I think two brilliant questions that you could ask in any job interview that you go to and this applies to men as well as women frankly are what is the paternal leave policy because like you say your partner's Um, employer might have a better one and shared parental leave is you know becoming used more often it's growing slowly but it is a a really big big part of the the solution and the second one is what's the company pension scheme Um, because again these things company to company one might be very generous another company might be not generous at all and um, I've written a piece for um, the FT today which is free to read um, it's for International Women's Day it's on all of the flick channels as well as my own personal social media where I talk about um, the best pod um, event we've interviewed um, Emily Bellet the founder of best pod on the podcast before fantastic woman um, there was a conversation about which firms offered what in terms of maternity leave um, that went on on the sidelines of one conference that I went to. And it was kind of almost more interesting than the panel discussion because you just can't find out this no. sorts of information. No, there was encouragement for companies who employed more than 250 people to encourage them to publish it. But you're right, it's very difficult to find that information. It's one of the reasons why my bump pay started in the first place. But I do think ask your networks if you can't find that information publicly Mm. because there will be somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody (laughs) who could help you um try and find out that information but i would also encourage women or individuals or couples that don't just join a company because they've got a great paternity pay policy you've got to think about the longevity of your 
career there as well mm. but obviously very very useful information to have mm. now Can I just add to yes there? please do. just i think there's a role for your employer here as well yes what we found with economic abuse is that it kind of can follow life stages and actually if you're pregnant you're more at risk of abuse mm. because of that financial dependency so we'd actually also encourage employers to be having conversations you know if um one of their employees is going off onto maternity leave to actually say things like you know have you talked about how you're going to manage, you know, are you going to be coming back to work? Those kind of conversations, um, because, again, it provides the space not only to have those conversations and to start normalising them, but, you know, perhaps potentially to disclose or to discuss any worries and for the employer, um, you know, to give information about, you know, support groups that might be needed while someone's on maternity. Um, to your point about paid um, contact days, you know, making sure you take advantage of those. So I think, you know, there's also that real sort of role um, that employers and other people in those positions can kind of take to start having these conversations and, and to make it okay to talk mm. about any concerns, you know, one of their employees might have. Well, one of your ideas from your blog, that my stepdaughter has recently had twins. Um, when she first found out she was pregnant, I sent her um, <laughs> these <laughs> articles from your website and I said, right, dear. Um, when you tell your boss um, that you're expecting, say that you want a projection of your maternity pay and what you're going to get month by month, um, because it is a shock to many people when they find out that there's probably going to be three months or maybe mm. even longer where they're going to get absolutely nothing. And this is when their personal finances are at the absolute kind of nadir yeah. because they're about to um, have to pay for childcare, oh. nursery deposits, um, all the rest of it. And she works for a FTSE 100 firm. I'm tempted to name them because I'm so angry, oh, no. um, but I won't because I want to remain on good terms with my stepdaughter. <laughs> Not anything else. But they just weren't able to do her a projection until I think a couple of weeks before she went on maternity leave. You need to be able to budget if you're going to have these big changes. And that, Nicola, I think is something that companies could could really do. I mean, to add insult to injury, the projection that they gave her has um, not been 100% accurate um, either. But budgeting when you're um, on maternity leave is crucial, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely common. And I love what you just said there. And, and actually in the book, we have a diagram that literally shows it in visual representation. So months, you know, one to nine almost, there's some money. And then months nine onwards, there is zero yeah. coming in. Um, and so that's why I've created on the website is this maternity pay budget sheet where you can put in what your earnings were before, what you expect to earn on maternity leave. And then you can try and project, for example, what you can afford on maternity leave and even how long you can afford to take leave for. Mm. Before we go to questions, um, Javini, anything that you want to add on this topic? Yeah, I mean, as you know, the ladies have been talking, one of the things that strikes me is that it really is a team effort. You know, for those women that are not having, you know, children by themselves, by choice or otherwise, if you're in a relationship in which you are choosing to start a family, it shouldn't be the burden of the woman alone to be thinking about some of the economic and financial consequences of starting a family and I think even you know it, I feel you know I cringe to think of you know some of the interviews that I've experienced in the past you know shortly after I got engaged going into an interview situation and being asked oh, you know were well, you engaged when do you intend to get married and then when do you intend to have you know start a family and I of course I shot those questions down mm -hmm. in flames mm -hmm. but it, you know I know that my experience is not a rare experience mm -hmm. and I'm yeah. sure Toby can attest yeah. to this but also, I think, you know, so of course, employees do have responsibility to make sure that they're asking appropriate questions yeah, during interview course, conversations. Yes. It's really encouraging to hear, Toby, mm. from you that your employer has completely waived or, you know, removed those stipulations around mm. eligibility criteria. Because I know there are innumerable women that will have been trapped Absolutely. as a result of maybe, you know, pursuing an exciting opportunity and then finding that they're pregnant. Mm. It's a brilliant time for them. But then suddenly feeling that they're now caught in limbo because they're now they've left a position where they were eligible for maternity pay. And now suddenly they're not. Um, and again, that burden is borne exclusively by the woman. So it really is important that we're able to have these conversations. But I think the other thing that I would add is that there is a conversation to be had, you know, to, specifically to your question about what should we be thinking about mm. before we start trying even understanding from your partner what is their attitude towards that financial dependency are they happy mm. to be the primary 
you know, to take the lead on finances in the relationship at a point where, as you say, you're at the nadir from your own financial perspective. Are they happy to shoulder responsibility for part of the childcare? To what extent, what proportion of that childcare are they happy to contribute towards? Mm. Because I think this is one of the things when you've got your love goggles on and you're deep in the throes <laughs> of the relationship, you've got hearts in your eyes, yeah. you're not asking your partner, you know, well, who's going to do the pick up and drop off? Yeah. You know, who, you know, in the school holidays, are you happy to, t- to use some of your holiday mm, um yeah. so having those kinds of conversations i think is also key mm. to this okay fantastic well i'm going to devote the rest of the session to your questions we're going to whip through um as many as we can um as possible now lots about joint accounts managing money jointly um in relationships which i'm pleased about because we can't talk about this <laughs> enough as far as i'm concerned um how do we prevent wealth inequality um, in a couple when one person bears the brunt of the childcare and therefore long term loss of earnings? Um, asks one viewer. Um, another person says, How can we manage our family fa- finances when one partner, in my case, my husband, earns significantly more money than I do? A ratio? It's a tricky power dynamic. Um, lots of similar questions um to, to that so i'll leave it as, as, as two that i'll that i'll read out but let's start with with the wealth inequality one i'll throw a little example in um a friend of mine um she's been trying for a baby for a really long time finally got lucky um and decided that she was going to give up work for a couple of years so that she could really enjoy um bringing up her daughter and is in a position where her husband earns a lot more than her, a lot more than she does. But they had to sit down and kind of have this negotiation because one thing that people tell me is like, if you're in that last three months of, of maternity leave or you're part time or, or you're not working, having to kind of ask yeah. for money, <laughs> uh, could I possibly have some? It, I mean, Toby, do you want to come on this first? Yeah, how how can we structure the talk? Yeah, I think. You said it earlier, don't have that talk just before you go to bed. <laughs> I think timing timing is so important. And I think structuring the talk as a family vision. So there's different ways that you might want to approach it, but it could be having a family vision board party, for example. A and, family vision board yes. party. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, laying out or cutting pictures or getting pictures from online of what you want your family set up to look like. And therefore then having a conversation about what it's going to take to achieve that and who needs to play which role at which time to achieve that so I think those are different ways to kind of have the conversation it can be incredibly daunting but I think looking at it as a kind of complete family goal does sometimes help any other advice for the imbalance got a couple of people talking about the ratio saying with the cost of living crisis is it fair to ask your partner to contribute more to household bills and how would you approach that conversation? I mean, our, our, our personal show, I earn more than my husband and we have a ratio method and I pay two thirds and he pays one third because I think that's fair. I don't want to denude his um, savings, not that he saves as much as he should, uh, but, you know, it's his money. I can't I can't force him to. Um, starting a conversation and saying that, though, is, um, is difficult, Davinia and Nicola. Mm, I mean, I thinking very practically really like the ratio method mm. purely yeah. because I think there's an it, it's objective mm. and I think conversations around money as much as you know it is numerical it's very emotionally charged and I think it's much easier to present a case for for why it should be done on the basis of ratio rather than us going to what has been viewed as the automatic balance which is 50 yeah. 50 which could ultimately lead the lower earning partner financially worse off when we look at disposable income so I think trying to achieve that gender parity in your relationship is a good model actually for them when you go out into the workplace you know we talked about you know Toby you talked about in the book negotiating and actually one of the spheres in which we also need to be negotiating is at home Mm -hmm. and setting those boundaries at home and if you're not establishing those parameters and establishing those boundaries at home Mm -hmm. and of course you go out into the workplace and you feel that your defenses are already lower than they might otherwise be so I think a ratio method and actually um, you know, having a joint account as well as your own individual accounts, because mm-hmm. I'm a big proponent of the Freedom Fund and the F Off Fund. We talk about the Freedom Fund <laughs> oh, yes. and Cash is Queen. We don't say F Off, no. but we do talk about the Freedom Fund I and Cash is Queen. Say that today. Done really well. <laughs> um, but the ratio method, I think, is a really good measure to make sure that there is that equity 
the financial perspective. Well, and if you want a conversation opener on your money date with your partner, <laughs> you can say, well, I was listening to a Financial Times <laughs> webinar, which the ratio method um, was <laughs> mentioned. It's not a sexual position. Um, it's, for dealing, it's for dealing with our bills. A um, couple of serious questions coming in about um, the risks of cohabiting. Um, without being married, particularly if you own a property. Mm. Um, another similar one, somebody who owns a property um, and their um, partner is about to move in, um, asking how it will affect them. I mean, I will share some links um, afterwards to articles that the Financial Times money sections problem page um, has done on these questions because they do come up time and time again but just on the um, subject of things like life insurance and also inheritance tax they're the two biggies really that you need to be thinking about as a couple um, if you don't have um, a, a civil partnership or or, or or a marriage if you are cohabiting there's no such thing um, as common law but I mean mm. Davinia a lot of women just don't don't realise this. Yeah. A lot of men don't realise. Absolutely. And I think this is the juncture. This is one of the questions that I get again quite frequently from rain check customers. Um, and this is the point at which I think it pays to get qualified and regulated financial advice. So this is not going on social media and taking advice from who mm. seems the most popular in the personal finance sphere, but instead speaking to somebody that is trained mm. to give you proper information and advice about what best to do so for example with regards to your property it might be making sure you've got an appropriate deed of trust in place mm -hmm. yep. so that it's quite clear who's contributed what and you're not having that wrangle in the event that the relationship should ultimately dissolve and of course you've got the emotional consequences to deal with there you don't also want to have to deal with the financial implications of that too um, but I think just being you know have, knowing your way around the different relationship statuses and, and the benefits and the consequences of each one, because as you rightly say, I think lots of us, because we live in such a um, far more liberal society than perhaps our grandmother's generations. And so on that basis, there are far fewer of us who are choosing to get married and not necessarily understanding that in cohabiting laws of succession, for example, are quite different than they might otherwise be. Mm. I mean, certainly, Nicola, there's been a lobby um, to change the law when it comes to giving cohabiting couples um, better rights for, for years. You see it with things like pensions. If you haven't filled in um, the expression of wish form for your pension, it's a bit of a, a funny name, but that's what it's called. Um, you know, maybe you have filled it in, but you haven't updated it. Mm -hmm. When you die, your per your pension will go to, to, to that person. Um, it could be your ex-husband mm -hmm. <laughs> if you haven't, haven't updated it. But there are lots and lots of things like this that couples need to think about, perhaps wills, um, a, a, or another one but we'll, we'll share some links to um to some pieces after that i'm going to go on to some questions more specifically about um investing and personal finance everything to do with investing says one of our viewers seems aimed at people um who've got more than ten thousand pounds but what about those of us who only have 10 to 40 pounds a month free after their emergency fund is sorted well i'm very glad that you put the question mm. like that because absolutely the emergency fund needs to be mm. priority number one before mm. you start um investing um you can um is the answer who wants to who wants to come in on investing with with small amounts i think i'll, I'll go, go first for um it's a really interesting question i think lots of people on maternity leave find that they can't invest whatsoever or if they do have something they're very fortunate to have something left over that they have small amounts and they're fantastic organizations um and apps and companies like a, a nutmeg or a plum where you can take these very small amounts and round up your spending and that kind of goes in some into some form of an investment fund so i think sometimes we make investment feel really big and really mm -hmm. scary mm -hmm. and I know obviously you, you know a lot about this but I think actually not being afraid to start small because compound interest is your friend over a long period of time. Oh goodness me yes and and also um, don't forget your company pension I mean you can still pay in while you're on maternity leave maybe that's something when you have the talk with your partner before maternity leave um, arrives it's something that they could, they could pay into in the case of my friend who stopped work decided to stop work for two years I pointed out to her that actually you can have a stakeholder pension and her partner could pay in £2,800 into it for her every year and she'd still get the benefit of the 20% 
um, top up from tax relief. So up to £3,600. And that's the case for anybody um, in the UK who's not earning um, a wage or in, indeed for children. Um, some people do start pensions for their <laughs> for their great. children, um, which is a great thing to do if you can if you can afford it. But we're here to talk about women um, <laughs> today. Um, a question about age gaps. Um, I'm going to jump to a bit of an unusual one. My parents um, have a notable age gap. It's inevitable that my mum um, will outlive my dad. She was a stay at home mum for most of her life and does not have any financial independence. I've tried persuading her to learn about her financial affairs, but she's not interested. How can I convince her? Nicola, do you want to go go first with some suggestions for this one? Oh, I don't know if I'm the right person to um, answer the question. I suppose I make, I make a parallel, I guess, in terms of victims and survivors who've been prevented um, over mm. time. And, and I suppose you can kind of see sometimes where, um, you know, perhaps someone you know hasn't worked hasn't been managing money um you know they're perhaps blind in terms of the finances and you know i can think of friends whose you know fathers have passed sadly you know and their mum didn't even know how to take money out of a cash machine or you know how to budget or how to sort of pay the bills um so you know i think something really important there again around you know financial literacy and you're just making sure that you know even if you're not you know doing that full time you at least you know are in a situation mm. where you could pick it up if you needed to um, and certainly a lot of the banks that we work with who are doing great things in terms of supporting victims and survivors you know will be able to support in other areas um, like that and um, you know will go to great lengths to support that victim survivor to be able to sort of regain control or, or to learn what they need to know to be in control moving forward mm. so a bit of a parallel but I think it's an interesting point. Mm. Barclays I can't remember it was called it was Digital Eagles or something they had a great scheme going on I'm sure they still have something along those lines to kind of help people of an older mm. generation get to mm. it to their finances mm. and there's a great author David Bark who's written lots of books the one that I love is Smart Women Finish Rich and he's written <laughs> lots of different books but he talks about um actually the importance in a later life of getting to grips with your um finances it's very american but the, i think the principles are very solid okay. um, we'll so, him. <laughs> um so if that person is a, a particular reader i recommend checking out one of his books brilliant now final question before we um go to our our poll um to to finish the event um somebody has very helpfully asked davinia what are some of the easy ways we can teach teens not just about budgeting but about the real financial skills they need to be an investor as well as a savvy spender and saver and i guess looking at our last question not ending up um in a position where they're in their 70s and don't know anything about how the household finances are running what would you what would you say to i that? love that question great so thank you to that reader. i didn't make it up <laughs> um and i think one of the things that we cover in the book is about gratification mm. which i think you know underpins everything that we do as adults you know the difference between immediate and, and deferred gratification and that you know by saving and investing you're effectively financing your future and investing in future you and that can look like a number of different things you know if you're talking to a teenager they'll probably have huge aspirations and ambitions for their lives it's the point in our lives when we are our minds and our, our imaginations are perhaps at their most fertile um, and so I think opening up the conversation from that perspective and thinking about the broader vision they have and how they intend to finance it is a great way to start the conversation you can then open up a discussion discussion about the difference between saving and investing, um, which I won't get into, but we do cover that in the book, as well as the difference between immediate and deferred gratification. And there are a number of exercises that the readers, young readers, can take to their parents to open up conversations in their household, whether that be, you know, if they're interested in, it could be gaming, for example, mm. you might have teenage girls that are interested in gaming, and rather than them acquiring all of the PlayStation games or Nintendo games, whatever it is, that instead they attempt to buy stock in those uh, specific companies that they like, whether it might be trainers and then they own Nike stocks, whatever it is, but engaging them in ownership rather than just consumerism, I think is a really great way to start that conversation so that they feel they've got a stake in the companies that they are biggest customers of. So wearing the product, but also being shareholders mm. in those companies too. And being aware of stuff. how they generate their profits is the other thing. It might okay. be a good investment, but a terrible use of your of your of your spare cash. Well, um, <laughs> thank you very much. So I've got I've got a situation where my, my ears are so clean they keep rejecting my um, <laughs> my earpiece. I'm going with that rather than the, the the opposite scenario. So it's time for us to ask you how confident you're feeling about money. So if you get your phones out, I think we're going to have a Slido. Um, uh, uh, I can't remember what these things are called. Um, 
a QR code. Thank you, brain, <laughs> um, which you can scan um, and t t tell us the answer to that question that we asked earlier. How confident are you about managing money in relationships? Hopefully, after we've spoken about it for an hour, you've picked up some tips from our panel of things that you're um, going to try. Maybe you're going to set a money date or um, think of a ways to, to talk about the ratio method. Well, whatever you um, choose, we we wish you luck with it. Just wait for those for those results to um, to to come in. Um, it certainly looks like, um, from what I can see, I think we have definitely um, caused an upswing. Um, <laughs> there are lots of people who are now saying, "I know what I need to to do to improve my." confidence managing money more so than there were at the beginning of the hour um, which is absolutely fantastic we do take this as a topic very seriously both at the financial times and um, ft live our events division who've put on this event for us today but also at ft flick our financial literacy and inclusion campaign we are a charity um, i am a trustee for full disclosure we've got our own website which is called ftflick.com Basically, every single article that I've ever written that's got a financial literacy theme in it is on there um, somewhere. The FT very generously makes them free to read. And I'm going to do a gigantic um, dumping um, of all of the things that we've um, articles on all of the things that we've talked about on Twitter, on Instagram and LinkedIn after the event. You can follow me. I'm at Claire B. We'll just quickly go around um, the panel to say goodbye with how you can keep in touch with people. So, Davinia, you are at Rain Check, which is CHQ. Absolutely, yes. And um, Nicola, you are at on C Resource. So, Surviving Economic Abuse, SEA, C Resource. SEA Resource. L loads of resources on our website, which I don't love to have spoken about. So, check them out. <laughs> Great. And there are some. Um, other questions that have come in, I should say, about specifically about economic abuse, which I'm going to pass to Nicola um, after the event. We're going to reply to you and give you some more resources that you can you can get in touch with. Um, and finally, Toby, tell us how people yes. can find you on social media. So at my bump pay. At my bump pay. Now, if you enjoyed this free event, then the good news is we're doing another free event, um, and this time it's, I feel awful about showing. This is this is to publicise my book, um, what they don't teach you about money. See what I did there which comes out um, with Penguin Books next Thursday. Um, we're doing a free event at lunchtime on Friday the 21st of April. If you want to sign up for that, go to ft.com slash money event. That's ft.com slash money event. We'll be back in the studio. I'll be joined by Isabel Berwick, who we mentioned earlier, the presenter of our Working It podcast. And we will be um, talking much more uh, about all of these themes, financial independence, managing money and relationships, and lots more besides. So whatever you are doing um, today to celebrate International Women's Day, thank you very much for joining us live um, from the FT. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. This session is available on Catch Up. You can follow Financial Times live on Twitter. Um, and watch it again. And if you want to get in touch with me specifically about something you'd like to see us writing about in the FT or an issue you think that FT Flick should be looking at, then you can email me. Our address is money at ft.com. So I am going to end by thanking our wonderful panel. I'm going to give you a round of applause um, as, a, as one person in the studio <laughs> because I think you're wonderful. Let's all clap each other. Let's <laughs> clap everyone for attending. See you soon.